from an outdoor hunting website that had a creepy experiences thread. On the trip in question I decided to hike the old Malala Indian trail that followed the ridge tops from Saddle Blanket Mountain to Oak Ridge, one of the Native Americans' favorite summer camps and trading centers. It was a beautiful August day, two days into the hike, I expected to be gone about two weeks, when literally out of the blue the most terrifying thing that ever happened to me in my life occurred. It would change my perspective of reality forever. I was walking along the trail enjoying the strong breeze and bright sunshine when, in the middle of a step, everything around me started to turn grey and blurry. The only way I can describe it was as if suddenly I was looking through someone else's prescription sunglasses. I finished the step and started another. Every inch I moved forward the darkness increased and the grey blurring turned into a jumble of shapes that made no sense. I then seemed to pass a barrier and everything started to return back into focus when my foot reached the ground on the second step everything around me had changed. Day had turned into night and there was no wind. All the Douglas fir and pine trees had been replaced with thick jungle-like growth. The cool thin mountain air was replaced with humid thick air. There were no stars in the sky, but there was a diffused light that let me see everything clearly, however I couldn't tell what the light source was. As often happens when the human body receives a massive dose of adrenaline the entire incident appeared like it was in slow motion and even though I was only there for a second or two I had time to observe my surroundings. The silence was broken by continuous high-pitched keening sound, and I was nearly overwhelmed with a sense of fear and danger. My momentum caused me to take one more step before stopping in my tracks. Actually gonna be three. It was at this point, I heard a whispered gotcha over my right shoulder. I couldn't tell if I heard it with my ears or inside my head. The word wasn't directed at me but something said the word quietly to itself. I was so terrified I actually felt my heart stop for a moment. That whispered word is what saved me. I opened my mouth and gasped in a huge gush of thick air and recoiled backward in the same footsteps I had entered wherever I was. As I threw myself backward, I looked over my right shoulder. A dark colored hairy right hand and arm was reaching for my throat over my shoulder. The hand had pale ivory spade shaped fingernails. The nails looked clean and almost had a manicured look to them. The thumb was placed lower, towards the wrist, on the hand than a human's is. Both hand and arm were thin and powerful looking and both were covered with thick coarse black hair. I got a good look at it because the thumbnail grazed my neck, it did not break the skin, as I moved backwards. As I continued backwards, the hand clutched where my neck had been a split second before and it seemed to fade off into the distance as I returned through the portal. I took two more steps backwards and everything reversed itself from what had just happened. The world around me became lighter, the fir and pines gradually came back into view and by the third step I was back on Saddle Blanket Mountain. I continued to move backwards in terror, and as I did, I observed that where I had just come from was a shimmering oval patch of air about the size of a large door. The woods behind it looked like it was underwater. By the fifth backward step the shimmering area seemed to just evaporate and everything was back to normal. By then my lungs had nearly burst from the volume of air I had inhaled during the huge gasp I had just taken. My body felt like it was on fire from the adrenaline surge. I spun around and ran back down the trail as fast as my legs could carry me, and didn't stop until I reached my truck. I was nearly two days getting to that place and about three hours getting back. On my way home I was absolutely horrified at the thought of what would happen if I were to drive my truck into something like that. It had been a trap pure and simple. Whatever it was that tried to kill me somehow kept the portal hidden from me on the way in, and I didn't actually see it until I was back out again. I had terrible nightmares for years, and still haven't come to grips with what happened. My fingers are trembling and the hair is standing up on the nape of my neck as I write this. Severely shaken, I've read everything I could get my hands on about people who have mysteriously disappeared throughout history, and discovered several instances where people have vanished in plain sight of others. The quantum physics people have a theory about parallel universes. They just might be right. Since I originally wrote this, 
Report number 9202 from Sutter County, California was submitted to the BFRO. The person who submitted the report drew a picture of a creature he saw in a tree. The right hand in the picture is exactly the same as the one I saw, note the thumb placement, and the forearm of the left arm is exactly like the forearm of the creature that attacked me. Any way you could post the pic from that thread? Very cool story though. Really lines up with my own theories. There was no picture, the thread was over 100 pages long but it was an older forum style that didn't have support for pics. Hey race the thread, damn good read. HTTP colon slash slash www.survivalistboards.com slash show thread dot php question mark. T equals 57236. Here's the pic the passage refers. to. It's hosted on a different website, not on that actual thread. Let me tell you a story about a horrible monster. Like most horrible monsters, she was a small, pretty girl. I met her in elementary school, before she became a terrifying beast. I didn't actually become friends with her until high school, before that she was a fairly normal child. I believe. But around the start of high school, she started to change. Or rather, everyone else did. Boys started working out and idolizing rock stars, girls started wearing tight clothes and fucking everything that moved. But she stayed the same. She called herself Baby. While the other students started finding interest in the opposite sex, Baby still found interest in stuffed animals and fluffy skirts. Being a true robot, I had no friends when I started high school. Like a lot of you, the first lunch period of freshman year, I had nowhere to sit. There was one completely empty table behind the disabled kids, which I assume was empty because no one wanted to sit by the disabled kids. But I had nowhere else. I sat down at the table on the far side of the kid who was listening to headphones and rocking enthusiastically. I have nothing against disabled kids, he was just rocking into the chair behind him, Elmo goes over the hill is a party song. Shortly after I sat down and accepted that I would die alone as all robots do, Something fluffy and pink appeared in the corner of my eye. I looked up, it was a pretty girl. I said. H hell hells. She smiled at me vacantly and said. May I sit with you? Not realizing that she was just being polite, not that she hadn't heard me, I breathed a sigh of relief and said. Sure. She sat, carefully straightening her skirts. She said nothing as she ate a tiny lunch. Again. Being a true robot, I didn't know when to keep my mouth shut. I asked her. What's your name? She smiled lightly and said, baby. I laughed and said, seriously? She turned toward me, she had big dark eyes and chubby pink cheeks. She really did look like a baby. She said, yes, and went back to eating. I realized I had been rude. I said, sorry, I thought you were joking. She said nothing. My name is Jake. She said, that's fine. I didn't know what to say to that, she didn't sound sarcastic at all. So I said nothing. We sat together at lunch every day for the rest of the year. Saying nothing every single day. There's nothing wrong with any of that though, not really. We weren't really friends, clearly, we just sat together for 40 minutes per day. But I saw her throughout the day too and sometimes action came to her. Early on in the year, some girls came up to her at lunch. They were your average whores, 14-year-olds wearing Ugg boots tucked into skinny jeans who had already taken three dicks in the ass apiece. Apparently, these whores had beef with Baby. A girl with a ridiculous poof of hair at the front of her head walked up next to Baby and tipped her little Hello Kitty lunch box over. She said, you look like the Barbie aisle at Walmart puked on you. Baby looked up at her with her empty smile and round eyes and said, that's a terribly rude thing to do, you know. The poof-headed whore laughed, who fucking cares what you think? Fucking dyke. No one cares what happens to you. Why don't you go home? Why don't you kill yourself too? I was quite shocked, never having seen girl bullying before. The bullying I was used to was somebody bigger than you punches you in the arm, calls you a fag, and then walks away. Baby wasn't having none of that shit. She stood up. Still smiling, pushed her chair in, 
and whispered into the girl's ear. The look on her face melted into fear. She backed up. She said, you're a freak. Cunt. Fucking faggot. Kill yourself. As she kept backing up and eventually ran away. The other girls stared. I, too, stared. Baby sat back down and cleaned up her lunch. The other girls left, presumably to find their friend. I asked Baby. What did you say to her? Baby said, nothing that wasn't true. That was a little unusual. I asked Baby. What did you say to her? Spoiler, pick related. So we can stop wasting time on this shit. Nope, they're both girls. Sorry to disappoint. Baby was the calmest person I had ever met. A few other instances of girl bullying happened, but every time, Baby gave them no fun reaction, so it stopped fairly quickly. But one day, something awful happened. As Baby and I were leaving the cafeteria, and Baby was going to the library to skip gym as usual, someone spilled soup on her. Now, even as a normal person, it sucks when someone spills food on you. But for Baby, someone spilling food on you is comparable to being burned with fireplace poker. She shrieked as though she'd just seen a baby carriage hit by a car. The boy who did it was grinning like a little faggot and his friend elbowed him and said, whoops. Baby. Wasn't having. None of that shit. She grabbed his face with her long, decorated fingernails and dug at his eyes. His friend left him and ran. Everyone around us ran too. The boy flailed and punched her as he tried to get away. I stood and watched because I'm fucking useless. The principal and school monitor came running in eventually, a lunch lady had run to the office and told them what was happening. They pulled her off of him, her little pink Mary Jane's kicking. She screamed, my brand. As they carried her away. It was fucking crazy. The boy was mostly okay. Baby didn't show up at school for a month. I figured that she had been expelled or sent to the alternative school. But then, a month later, Baby came back, in a fluffy mint green dress and little mint green matching shoes, smiling her vacant smile like nothing had happened. At first I was hit with a rush of joy, she was back. My lunch friend was back. But then I remembered, this girl violently assaulted a boy for pouring soup on her. I was still excited though. I asked, baby, how are you? Where have you been? Baby's smile seemed to become less doll-like and more genuine. Maybe she thought it was nice that someone had missed her. She said, one go to the hospital sometimes. They just need to make sure I'm alright. Oh, did you get burned by it or something? No. Oh, so like a mental hospital? Yes, like that. So you didn't get in trouble or anything? No. That boy was in the wrong. He did a horrible thing and he was punished for it. I did nothing wrong. Why would I get into trouble? Maybe because you clawed a guy's eye out? But I said, oh, I was just wondering. And that was the last we spoke of it. Maybe girls really do get special treatment. Is that all there is to this story? To the story of her return, yes. But there are more stories coming. I guess I should switch to green text. Been eating lunch with baby for almost the whole year. Summer is coming. Baby actually talks to me. Would you like to come over to my house? Pretty girl asking me to come over? She did maul a baby. But she's a girl and I might get to touch boob. Why yes. Wonderful. I'd like to have you over tomorrow at noon, is that alright? Why yes. Good. Home on Saturday. Getting ready to go over. Mom doesn't want me to go. She knows about the attack. Tell mom not to cock block me. Dad agrees. She gives up. Dad drives me to her house. Baby greets me at the door. Hello, please come in. I hope you didn't have any trouble finding your way here. And no trouble. Boob on my mind, boob on my mind. I might touch a boob today. Walk through the living room. Her parents are there. They say hello. They both look me up and down. I guess I don't look so good, or at least not like what they would expect her to bring home. They look normal and so does the house. 
I'm just a dumpy little fat man. Her dad says to leave the door open. She says, yes, of course, daddy. As she leads me upstairs, she quietly says, daddy is always afraid that I'll let some dirty nasty boy touch me and get me pregnant. Oh. She opens the door to her room. It's. It's a baby's room, yes. The floor is covered in a large, fluffy, pink rug. The giant bed has a fluffy blanket on it. Stuffed animals fucking everywhere. They're everywhere. There is a human-sized stuffed bear sitting at one of those short Japanese tables. There are cups and a teapot sitting on the table. She gestures me in. I walk in. She says to take off my shoes. I do. She tells me to sit. I do. Next to the bear. His unseeing eyes stare out into the fluff. She sits with us. She starts to pour us tea. She offers me a cup. Thank her. Start to sip. She says, careful. It tastes horrible and burn why. Spit it back into the cup. It's whiskey. I hold my little cup and stare at her. She says. You don't like it? I can get you something else. I tell her it's fine just because I don't want to get my eyes gouged out. We sit the bear and sip our whiskey. She finally says, so? TM sorry. So, what do you think? Of what? My room. What do you think of my room? It's, nice. She smiled and nodded, pleased. The bear sighed in relief. Would you like to come over again sometime? Okay. Wonderful. I'm quite fond of you. You don't put up a fight like other people. You're better than them, you know. TH thanks, I like you too. We sat in silence for several more hours. Her mom brought us tea cakes at some point. I went home hammered. More to come. I have to take a break for a while, internet trouble. So freshman year ended, I only saw her once over summer break. She gave me apple juice instead of whiskey. First day of sophomore year. Everyone getting into their groups for the year. I keep my eye out for baby all morning. I haven't seen or heard from her since early summer. The bell rings for class to start. Oh no. Did she move or something? Go to class very disappointed. All the classes are half length today because it's the first day. About 10 minutes into my third class. Foods and cooking. Baby saunters in. Looks like pick related but in black and mint. Her face looks so sweet but so empty. She turns to the teacher and says, I'm very sorry I'm late, I hope I'm not interrupting. The teacher is clearly just as amused as the rest of us. She says, you're fine, go sit down. Baby walks down the aisle. Spots me. Hello, Jake. There's no other chair at my table. Get out of my seat. Push it closer to her. Crouch. She smiles for real. Smooths her skirts and sits down. I look around. Everyone is starring. Fuck you guys, I'm sitting with a pretty girl, I don't care if she looks like a circus. I am gonna touch that boob. She smells like coconut. I'd never had a class with her before. This will be a great year. I'm gonna touch that boob and who knows what else. Bell rings. Oh. Oh no. Baby stands up. Oh no no please. Baby looks at me. Is something wrong? I was thinking about the boob and smelling a girl. My dick is diamonds. One I am okay, I dropped something, you go on. She stares. No you didn't. What do I do? Why God? Why would you do this? I was going to touch the boob and who knows what else. She grins suddenly. Oh. I see. I hope you find it. She skips away. Tuck my dick into my waistband and drag my shame with me to my next class. The first time a girl mortified me. Good times. Baby started talking to me more in sophomore year. Which is great in a way, because at least I have some wild memories. Baby has her driver's permit. Having a permit means you can drive, but only if you have an adult in the car with you. Baby's car had tinted windows, so. 
Baby wasn't having none of that shit. Turns out Baby loves driving. She asks me one night if I want to go somewhere. Her room. The park I guess. I think that would be lovely. Be ready at 5. I do as I am told. For some reason, I just don't argue with Baby. Baby pulls up at my house at 5. I had warning to her arrival because the house started shaking and a car alarm got set off by her music. Her, her dad's, I believe, car looks fancy. It's all black and shiny and shit. It bounces as the music inside blares. The passenger door swings open. Power metal blasts me in the face. Cover my ears on reflex. Can't even keep my cool for a second in front of a girl. She sees my discomfort and turns it off. Ah, uh, sorry about that, I wasn't thinking. It's okay. I get in. So do you still want to go to the park? Oh, wasn't that the plan? Sure, sure. That's fine. I just wondered if there was somewhere you'd rather go. I just sit there like a fucking idiot. The park it is. She smiles that chubby-cheeked smile at me. She's a surprisingly good driver for someone with presumably no experience. But then. I don't mind the guys posting the fake story, this is slash r9k slash, it should be expected. I am going to start tripping though for the sake of clarity. We aren't taking any roads that I know would lead to the park. Ask, where are we going? I just want to show you something first. Dear God, let it be the boob. Oh okay. And that's what I like about you, Jake. You don't question. You don't argue. You just know that I know what's best. You're one of the good ones, Jake, don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Okay, that's not right. TH thank you. We drive for a long time. It's late fall, so it starts getting dark. She hasn't really said anything else since. I'm getting a little creeped out. She pulls over. We're in the middle of nowhere. It's just woods. She says, we're here. We get out. I notice she's wearing hiking boots instead of little pastel shoes. Her whole outfit is actually much more simple than usual. No extra bows or anything hanging off of her. I'm getting very creeped out. She says, are you ready? No. No I am not. Yeah I guess. She turns and walks into the woods. Follow her. It's getting seriously dark now. I keep follow sound of her feet crunching over leaves. Until the sound stops. She turns on a flashlight. We're standing in front of a house. A shitty old house that nature took back. She smiles. Now we're really here. This is some Blair Witch bullshit. I'm not making any move. She holds her milky little hand out. Come with me. I, I am sorry, I don't want to go in there. Are you afraid? Yes. Are you afraid of me? No. Then you shouldn't be afraid of anything. What? Take my hand. I still hesitate for a second. I take her hand. Maybe I should actually put the trip on, in that case. The basement really shows how ancient this house is. The stairs are made of stone. They're slippery with what feels like mud. The flashlight hits the walls occasionally, from what I can tell, they're mostly just dirt. Please don't let me die having a goddamn farmhouse fall on me in the woods. Actually, please don't let me die here at all, this has gotten way out of my control. We get to the bottom. It smells wet and coppery. The floor is just dirt. This is a Saw movie, isn't it? She says, I'm going to show you something. You won't tell anyone. Okay. She shines the light at the far wall. It's full of tools. Saws, hammers, things I don't recognize, saws, sharp things, saws. This is literally a saw movie now, I was just being a pussy before. Stare in horror for a very long time. I finally look at her. She's staring at me. Her eyes are wide. She's breathing hard. Well? What do you think? I I. Tell me what you think about what you're seeing right now. I I am scared. She keeps staring and huffing for a while. 
She finally stops and regains her normal blank face. She walks over to me slowly. Back away. Stop. Don't run from me. I'll try to stop. She wraps her arm around my waist. She turns the flashlight off. Please God no. No. I don't deserve this. Never even touched the boob. She says, 1 am so very fond of you. I don't want you to be afraid of me. As Deegfs gasped. You never question me. You don't argue or disagree. You do everything I ask of you. You must really trust me. I just wanted to touch the boob you crazy bitch. You're better than all of the others. You deserve more. I want you to be mine. Would you like that? Well, if the other option is get murder in a cabin in the woods. Why yes. Wonderful. She turned the flashlight back on. She led me upstairs. And back through the woods. And to the car that thankfully hadn't been stolen or towed. We said nothing on the entire drive back to my house. And so it really begins. OP you fucking imbecile. You had prime opportunity to the ever-loving burn dough off of this Lolita whore and you pussied out. Well, I'd give you my word that I'm OP, but I know that doesn't mean shit here. Ha 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 ha, no. No no no. No I did not. Anyway. Lunch the following Monday. Baby asks if NL come over to her house that afternoon, although now we both know I don't really have a choice. I agree. Quickly say that I'll have my dad drive me, so she doesn't have the opportunity to take me back to whatever the fuck that shit was. She says that's fine. That afternoon. Mom says she doesn't want me to stay out as late as I did last time. Yeah me neither, Mom. Dad drives me over and congratulates me on having a girlfriend. He says he was worried I might be a fancy lad since I went so long without interest in girls. Dad can you not? He pulls something out of his wallet and gives it to me. He says. Don't say anything, it's just in case. I don't want you to ruin your life getting a girl pregnant so young. Dad maybe you should be worried about serial killers or cat stranglers, turns out there's way worse shit teenage girls can do than get pregnant. TH thanks. Get out. Go to her door. Door pops open before I knock. Hello, please come in. Why bother being so polite all the time, a polite kidnapper is still a kidnapper. Upstairs. She closes the door behind us. Don't your parents make you keep the door open? It's fine, they won't say anything. Why, did you cut their tongues out? Okay. We sit at the little table. The bear from before now has matching giant friend. Nothing much has changed in here except the addition of many stuffed animals and a new computer. Are you feeling alright? Why yeah. She stares. You're upset about it, aren't you? Yeah. Tell me why. Because, you're apparently killing people out in a shed somewhere, I thou dash. No. No. I have never killed anyone in my entire life. Don't say that. Don't think that. I do not kill people. Okay. Believe me. How am I supposed to believe you when you took me out there and showed me all of that? She looked angry. Her little pink lips pouted. You always believe me. You trust me. You don't argue. I want to respond, but... She gets up and comes over to me, pushing White Bear out of the way. Brown Bear gasps. She stands above me with her petticoats brushing my chin as I look up at her. You have to trust me. Okay. You're mine now. You don't need to be afraid. She holds my face with one hand. Trust me. Put your faith in me. Fuck it, we all die someday anyway. Okay. She kept holding my face for a long time. Then she tipped me back on the floor. She sat down on me. Those things are, unpleasant. To look at. What? She slid her hand up my shirt. No, not my moobs. You don't want to touch the moob. I feel so silly. They call it making love, you know. What do you think that means? Am silent. I think my boner says everything I need to. 
Could it be that that's what makes you feel love? Do you think? Why don't you? She quietly rubs my chest for a while. I think if I could feel love, I would feel it for you. I want to try. Wow what the fuck? Mean. Okay, but like. Wow. Are really? Don't worry, my parents aren't home, I lied. Well you sure put up a good argument. Okay. Bear turned away in disgust. Baby stood. She took off her socks. She unlaced her dress. She took off her blouse. And petticoats. And undershirt. And bloomers. She was so much smaller without all those layers of clothes. Delicate, even. Ripped my shirt and pants off in a about two seconds. She backed over to the bed and sat down. I'd never seen her act awkward before. I tried not to seem extremely nervous and gross. That's not easy to do as a dumpy little fat virgin. How do I get the bra off? I am gonna touch that boob, god damn it, I've earned it. It has snaps in the front. Oh good, she was prepared I guess. Pop it open. Release the breasts. They're beautiful. Little milky white handfuls with little pink nipples. My dick is on fire. How to grab boob without being an idiot about it. Grab them like I'm picking out oranges at a grocery store. I can hear Bear laugh at my inexperience. She's actually a good sport about it and just grins a little. She takes her bra the rest of the way off and lays down. I sort of sit on my feet in between her legs. Touch the boob again. That is a nice boob. Totally worth it. She's eyeballing the D through my boxers. Wait, what did she say about those things? Keep touching that boob, we'll deal with that when we get there. She says, I don't really want to see it. If you could just, get it in there, that would be good. Like now? Not right now. Okay. Just let me know. Boob, ass, hips, waist, soft skin, legs. So much good in the world. What was I worried about again? She says, okay. Huh? TM ready now. Oh right, that. Oh okay. So, do you want me to just? Yeah, just get it in there. I don't wanna look at it. Okay. I'll take off her panties. Oh god, please last long enough to get it in there. It's just a little pink mound with a little pink crease in the middle. So modest. Spread it. It's all hot and wet inside. No worries, no fear, this is a happy place. I'll position myself as unawkwardly as I can above her. Trying to get my dick in. Every time I think I'm about to get it, she flinches and it slides out. Hey, are you nervous? We can stop. No we can't, you can't stop this dick, not now. No, it's fine. I'm sorry, I'll try harder. Thank God. Line it up one more time. Start to push it. She flinches, but it stays in. Slides in a little further. She makes a pain sound. Suddenly it slides all the way in. She yelps and digs her nails into my shoulders. My dick. I want to give her a minute, but if I don't start now, I'm just gonna come all over the place. Start thrusting awkwardly. She keeps making little whiny noises. Trying as hard as I can not to come. My dick burns. She wraps her arms and legs around me. I'm ready. What? You can finish now. Oh thank god. Come with the force of an atomic bomb. I am properly subdued. You can kill me now. I touched the boob. She rolls me off of her. She lays there for a second. Then she snuggles up to me with her head on my chest. Fall asleep. When I wake up. Probably an hour or so later. She's dressed again. Hey, I need to take you home. My parents are coming back soon. Okay. Get dressed. Bear shakes his head in disgust. She takes me home. When we roll into the driveway, the door are still locked. She sits there for a bit. Then she says, I love you. She looks over at me like she's curious. I love you too. She sighs and nods. All right. Well I will see you tomorrow. 
She unlocks the door. I get out. Watch her drive away. Go back in my house. Go to my room without saying anything to my parents. Get in bed. Stare at the ceiling. Suddenly realize I didn't use a condom. What? The end. She didn't get pregnant, luckily, but it was a horrible realization at the time. Oh, and also. We're moving in together in two weeks. Good night, slash R9K slash. All that foreshadowing for nothing. I guess she kept tools in an abandoned house for fun. Yeah what's up with the plot hole? Actually still wonder if what she does with that shit. I don't have proof of anything, though. But there's no way she keeps that shit out there for no reason. Also she accidentally killed two girls on two separate occasions, both of which were during fights, and both of which she served time for in juvie. Those stories just weren't really interesting enough to include also I know she's doing something horrible out there in the woods. I'm kind of hoping that if I turn up missing after we move in, the police will search my internet history, fin this, and know what's up. For real though, good night, stood about 30 feet from what people refer to as a wendigo, thought I was going to die. I can post a story if interested, but I've tried before and the thread was washed out by our ping faggots. I'm calling BS that thing would have ripped you apart if you were feet from it. Maybe. Maybe not. All depends on whether or not Anon is a Templar of slash K slash. Not a Templar from slash K slash, but I'm almost certain I came across it after it had killed two German Shepherds. Which might have been what saved me. When I first saw it, I thought it was a big white dog, it was crawling on all fours. It never stood up, never vocalized, just watched me. It only moved when I moved, but it was more of a maneuver like it was trying to get a good look. It was incredibly fast though. Yeah, I can do that. I don't think I'm going to green text though, so sorry if it's a little long. From about the age of 16 to the age of 21, 24 now, I used to go on walks late at night, my sleep schedule was fucked after school ended and so I spent most of my time awake during the late night slash early morning hours. But living in a more suburban area, it was never really an issue. That isn't to say I live in a nice area, just that it's not really as crime ridden as it could be. But I digress. I had worked out a pretty solid schedule for these walks, leaving at anywhere between 10 to 12 at night and coming back either when I had had enough serenity for the night or my legs began to ache. Generally though, each walk would last 3 to 5 hours, during which I would travel out of my neighborhood into the neighboring areas. Another thing to note is that my neighborhood, for whatever reason, only has a handful of streetlights, usually at the small stop sign intersections. Because of this, I became very comfortable with being in the dark, and developed a love for the moon. I always made it a point to leave a little earlier during full moons to enjoy the peace, silence, and the glow that pure moonlight casts over everything. So anyway, on to this particular night. It was fall. I remember because the air had just begun to carry a chill, and a really specific sort of smell that seems so come with the changing of the seasons. I left a little later than normal that night, having been distracted by gaming. I do distinctly recall staring up at the moon, and being overcome by a strange feeling. I don't really know how to describe it, only that it felt different. Even now though, I think it was the schedule being off kilter that particular night that caused the feeling because that's just what makes the most sense. Anyway. I took my normal path, heading down a few streets of little note and making my way toward a favorite stretch of road. It's one of those that have no street lights to speak of, and the houses along the sides are bigger, the type with the big yards pushing the buildings a hundred or so feet out from the roadside. I remember seeing the road and staring into the darkness, accustomed to the sight even with the moon as bright as it was, it always gets brighter inside, it's just a trick of the shadows since there are some spots on the road that are covered pretty heavily with trees. And I was almost overcome with a very specific feeling, one that I hadn't felt in several years of taking these walks, dread. To be completely honest, I was surprised at myself, and irritated, and it was that irritation that made me continue walking. I ended up quietly humming to myself as I entered the darkness, Layla by Derek and the Dominoes, if you're curious, and had made it about 100 yards down the road when I heard a loud scuffling down the driveway to my left, about 10 yards away from me. I moved into a heavily shaded area and watched, 
noting that whatever was moving down the gravel driveway was big, and sounded like a dog. Much to my surprise, it seemed to be a huge, white dog. At least, until my eyes focused on it. In the moonlight, sometimes things take on an eerie glow and shapes can be misconstrued, so I was only watching it with curiosity until it got a little closer, and I realized that it wasn't white fur shining in the moonlight, but skin. Bare, pale skin. This caused a shift in my perspective and I began inspecting the rest of this new sight, only to realize that it wasn't a dog at all, but a man. A very tall, incredibly emaciated man. His skin was pulled tight over his skeleton, and he trotted along on all fours as if it were the most natural thing in the world. At this point, I was a definite combination of freaked out and interested, so I took a single step closer, as quietly as I could, and squinted my eyes to get more specific details. Its legs seemed to be normally shaped, as far as a human's go, but the forearms were elongated, giving it a very surreal hunch that was, obviously, not human. Oh, another thing to note is that its head was completely bald, and the moonlight hit it and made it glow, which is sort of funny. And then I noticed it was looking at me. The light reflected off of its eyes with a dim yellow shine, which is what drew me into getting a good look at its face. It was featureless. Not blank, but there was nothing notable about it. It had no ears that I could see, its nose, if it wasn't a trick of the light, was very small. No lips to speak of. And it just stared. We stared at each other for several long seconds, my mind reeling as I struggled to come to some sort of solution for how I would get out of this situation. But none came, that is, until a car's headlights flashed down the road. In my idiotic half panic, I turned my head to see if the car was coming down the road I was on, and as soon as I did, I heard a rapid, heavy shuffling. I jerked my head back and the thing was gone. I struggled with keeping my fear in check and made a cursory scan of the area around me, and I found it, sitting in the yard to my left. It was about 20 feet away this time, sitting in the big yard just outside of the light being given off by the home's porch light, it was one of those huge yards I mentioned earlier, so there was some space between it and the house too. The only reason I noticed it at all was because I had caught the very end of its movement, otherwise the yard was heavily shaded by a bunch of trees. So, I stared. And it stared. We watched each other me standing on the side of the road in the dark, and it hunched down in this yard, motionless as far as I could see. Finally, my mind settled into a solution I could actually make work, I have phone shortcuts, and I know my best friend is awake, as I had been talking to him before I left. So I called him, never taking the phone from my pocket until I heard the muffled what's up of my friend answering. I placed my hand over the light sensor of the screen to make sure it was dark when I pulled it from my pocket, placed the phone to my head, and said, TM on, street name, get here as soon as you can. Luckily, he was able to understand how serious I was being, and hung up immediately. Thus began the longest five minutes of my life. I closed my phone and slid it back into my pocket, never taking my eyes off the thing. Fortunately for me, it seemed keen on simply staring in turn. I don't remember my thought process in detail, only that one thought of, I can't believe this is happening, repeating over and over every few seconds. Then, mercifully, headlights. Knowing that it was my friend, I began slowly backing away toward the oncoming car. The creature, apparently realizing that the vehicle was heading in our direction, turned and bolted away, slamming into the fence between the yard it was in and the driveway it had come from, scaling the fence and disappearing. Feeling safe enough to turn, I was getting ready to run to my friend's car. I slowly rotate toward the headlights to see not my friend's car, but a police patrol car. I froze in place as the headlights washed over me and the car just cruised on by, my friend's vehicle right behind it. He pulled over and I was in the car before he even put it in park. Not that it mattered much, because I told him to get me the fuck out of there immediately. He kept asking questions, but it was around that time that the full weight of the experience hit me, and I just sort of sat there in silence, trying to process what I had seen. He drove off, and I noticed that the police car had stopped in the driveway that the thing had come from, with two officers getting out and making their way toward the home. It occurred to me then, that if they had been called by the owner of the house, a woman with her two big German shepherds, that if she had reported a disturbance, the cops would most likely have stopped and questioned me. 
unless they were given a more specific description. And like I said, I haven't seen those dogs since. Jeez. As someone who used to take a lot of walks at night, before I got chased out of the local park, and all the way to a fallback point by someone making elk calls, you acted a shitload smarter than I ever would have in that situation. Also, even worshipping at the altar of slash k slash would likely not have saved you in that situation, if it could move that bloody fast. This, happened in friggin, suburbia? Did the neighborhood border a large forest, perhaps? The alternative is, not something I want to ponder on at the moment. Yeah, it was fast. For a little more accurate perspective, the space it cleared in the time it took me to look behind myself and then back was about 40 feet, diagonally from where our positioning was before. But no, no forest. That, specifically, is something I've thought a lot about in the last few years. I don't know why it was here, of all places. I'm not even sure where it could have come from, or gone. Modified the Anons archived post with the new information. But no, no forest. That, specifically, is something I've thought a lot about in the last few years. I don't know why it was here, of all places. I have theories. I partially do not want to share them, for fear in doing so might make them legitimate. Something that moves that bloody fast invalidates way too many forms of infantry portable weaponry. I'm not even sure where it could have come from. That's relatively easy to pin down. Or gone. Theories. Not many of them good. Sewers. The absolute fuck is. I don't know why I didn't consider sewers before. That's a little troubling. But if you've got ideas, please tell me. I don't really leave the house at night anymore, and the more I can settle this, the better. I really feel like I lucked out, and I miss going on walks at night, but I'm not feeling like running into it again. From what he was hinting at what with the infantry portable weapons bit, the theory would probably involve some secret government super soldier experiment. But maybe I'm way off. Maybe. I don't know. There's no answer that I feel has been good enough, in a weird sort of way. Like no explanation is adequate for what happened. I've told other, older relatives about it, and the general consensus from them is always something akin to, there are old things out there and on, and that's sort of it. Like what the fuck? That's easy for you to say you old bastard. But if you've got ideas, please tell me. Okay. So the nearest medium large forest doesn't see much, human, traffic anymore, at least not, hypothetically, that of the overgunned nature, and in mass numbers. So it leaves the forest, migration, and seeks out easier prey, since it's got used to the taste of man flesh and would rather not have to deal with, fucking aim dodging, hunting parties in order to slake its hunger. Or maybe it has been forced to flee from its former hunting grounds because of said overgunned hunting groups slash SND squads. In any case, it moves to the local town slash outskirts of a minor city and begins stalking the streets. Check the missing persons reports in your area, see if there's an uptick in missing vagrants or a downtick in the local homeless population, and I feel like a fucking sociopath for even considering that idea, I mean, thinking of an entire demographic as beast kibble? FFS. I don't really leave the house at night anymore, and the more I can settle this, the better. I really feel like I lucked out, and I miss going on walks at night, but I'm not feeling like running into it again. Pro tip, don't. Do not walk outside at night, no matter what. The theory would probably involve some secret government super soldier experiment. No. No, this is something else, something that predates modern governments. This is something that those that lived here before, those of the First Nations, fuck this Indian term, knew somewhat well. Maybe, maybe, a hybrid of some of those creatures, somewhat like a coy wolf? The infantry portable weapon bit? Just thinking of such kind of weapons one would take out on a hunting expedition to gank one of these things, the main problem is the fucking aim dodging. The thing about beasts is that they don't know how guns work and thus can't dodge as your shots asterisk. Unless it's supposed to be really smart or something I don't know. But then you'd think it wouldn't go out and fuck around with people and dogs and shit in a populated area. T's funny you say that, about the homeless population. It was an observation I'd made a long time ago when I was still regularly walking. 
Remember, I've been wandering this city for years by the point of this story. We don't have a homeless population. I've never seen a homeless person in this city. Just outside of it, sure, there are camps. But here? Nope. I've only ever come across trash and stuff, what I assumed to be the remains of a camp. Well whatever it is the police obviously didn't run across it and they didn't know to be looking for you either, but apparently they did know that they should be looking for something the question is what were they told. It might have survived long enough, and slash or witnessed other creatures slash others of its kind, or separate subspecies that don't share their holy shit fucking chia, speed, get slash k slash isled by the previously easy prey that are now armed with bang sticks. But then you'd think it wouldn't go out and fuck around with people and dogs and shit in a populated area. Hmm. <laughs> but then again, there are incidents of bears and shit wandering into downtown areas, albeit not hunting for man flesh, might be an aberrant specimen? I don't know what to think now. But apparently they did know that they should be looking for something the question is what were they told? Probably were informed of something in the residence yard by the same individual. Shite. Can you just imagine watching something outside tear apart your pets? Can you just imagine watching something outside tear apart your pets? They probably would have had guns drawn for that. Even if they did just think it was a coyote or wolf or bear or mountain lion or whatever lives in that area. I have no idea. Honestly, I was always put off approaching the woman simply because I was afraid. I didn't want to upset her, and it just sort of fell away from my priorities taking a name so it's easier to differentiate. This isn't really an area where guns are a common thing. Lots of middle-aged, middle-class white people living near a city, if that helps. Still if they got a report something was attacking animals the first thing they probably still think is wild potentially dangerous animal. Partially advise reaching out to her, or to members of her family that might live in the same house. As if it wasn't bad enough that the thing can fucking aim dodge, it's hunting in a no guns slash less guns state too. Okay, revising earlier comment, it's moved out of the woods to find better hunting grounds because nobody really fucking goes there anymore. Though the cops, at least, would still be armed. Checking the account, Wendigo P does not mention whether or not the officers drew their service pistols on approach, only that they moved towards the property in question. I'm trying to recall if I saw them leave with weapons drawn but all I remember is seeing both front doors open on the patrol car, and the silhouettes of the officers moving up the driveway. The headlights were throwing shadows, so I can't see for sure either way, only that there were two of them. True Wendigo Op didn't mention it but I would have thought if the police had their weapons drawn that would have been something that they would have mentioned. So did the police have their guns drawn? Motioning that we refer to this creature as Boris Wendigosis. Chances are by this point, Wendigo P has moved on from the thread, and might not search it up again, but I sort of wish to know, what city is this? Not for any sort of individual identification of Wendigo P, but merely to file the population center in question into a list of places I will never friggin tread in, ever. The city is Orangevale CA. It's not very noteworthy, really. Out of the way, but still pretty close to actually nice areas for most people I suppose. Orangevale. California? Defy a no-guns state. As in part of the fucking Sacramento Metropolitan Zone. I'm. I'm going to crack a fucking bottle of absolute and. Ponder this shit for a while mind is sort of, gone ATM. Yep, that's really what throws me off. There's nowhere it could really be living, unless it wandered in from the foothills, or lives in the sewers. I don't think it was a Wendigo, it sounds like it was as afraid of you as you were of it. That's an aspect of the story that I think is what sticks out to most people I've told, but we also have to remember that the majority of stories told by other people about Wendigos are fake. I'm of native descent, and a part of the interest for me is the lore, and of all the stories of the things we call Wendigos only really focus on them being hungry. There's nothing to say they're anything more than a different type of predator. That being the case, if it wasn't a Wendigo, that's what it took the form of. At least the popular form. I've read a handful of stories about people seeing things like this on here. May I ask what tribe your heritage is? Choctaw. Possibly Choctaw and something else, but that's only been hinted at and my grandfather didn't really give a damn about his family and died before. I was old enough to ask him. 
Also that picture's pretty good. Make it skinnier, and make the arms a little longer and that's damn near spot on. How is this? Holy fuck dude. That's insane. The only thing I saw is that the arms are too long, now. From what I could see on the thing, they were about the same length as its legs. Which is why its gait was so strange, and gave it only a slightly irregular hunch. Its back end was kind up raised up, which makes me think maybe it just leaned harder on its front. How does this go find it? Yep, that's basically the shape of it. Even the head turn. Shit's crazy. Okay, I'm back. Current archive progress, encounter itself is on PG-1. Reached out to an acquaintance that lives near Chico, who's almost addicted to this kind of spooky stuff. He's got some decent RCV, remote-controlled viewer, his term, assets that he could conceivably use to scout out the sewers throughout the general location of Orangevale, though he did mention that the proximity to Folsom Pen might raise a few red flags. Almost as bad as the time he fucked up hard near Laua. It will take some time before he gets there, but if you see a blue camper van with gold racing stripe decals driving around at dusk, that might be him, though I don't advise going up to it, just in case it's someone else. Says, stay the fuck away from that place. You don't shit where you eat. I'll keep that in mind. But yeah, as much as I would like to go looking for it, remote control seems like the best bet. Assuming it follows any predatory standards. But there really isn't a lot to go on in that regard. Solo predators take steps to hide their presence all the time, cats are big on it. It's feasible it wouldn't act in the middle of the street vs an adult male human not the safest spot to get down no matter how big or fast you are. People on slash x slash underestimate how scary we are to the other side of things, humans are not to be taken lightly. Said the Wendigo. That's fair but most predatory animals that aren't looking for trouble tend to avoid or ignore humans slash potential threats slash etc. As well, it's around 3 a.m. during our confrontation, so the street is deserted. So either it really didn't know how to handle being seen so obviously, or this was unfamiliar territory and it was being extra cautious. But if the old stories are to be believed, that wouldn't stop it from taking me on. That's fair but most predatory animals that aren't looking for trouble tend to avoid or ignore humans slash potential threats slash etc. Not the ones that are the right size for it, countless examples of tigers or other big cats having a go at a human. As for where it might have come from, perhaps either El Dorado National Forest, or any one of the number of national forests in Cali. There's a bit of other stuff, but those are unconfirmable rumors. Stuff like one of the observation posts, not a control installation, in the west coast Sasis grid being located on one of the islands. People on slash x slash underestimate how scary we are to the other side of things, humans are not to be taken lightly. I. We got to this point of development by being nigh on about the most murderous motherfuckers in the proverbial jungle. We often react, violently to threats. It still spooks me a bit to think that some of these creatures might be moving into urban areas, but I sort of see their POV, after all, us humans sure as fuck don't leave the woods, their territory, alone. God damn it, now you got me even more spooked, even though it's a completely bullshit scenario, damn things on some former meals Samsung smartphone, you know, a model from before the Nuke 7's release. Watching this thread at the moment now it could know how much of a fucking OCP its speed is against any fucking real world ground force, fucking aim dodging, if it doesn't already, and of said acquaintance making plans to put on over into Orangevale local in his indirect survey on. I. We got to this point of development by being nigh on about the most murderous motherfuckers in the proverbial jungle. We often react, violently to threats. That's an understatement not only that we're smart and organized about it, it's totally feasible something would shy away from a straight-on fight with an adult male in the middle of a mass of sleeping humans. As for where it might have come from, perhaps either El Dorado National Forest, or any one of the number of national forests in Cali. That's a long way out though, no matter how you look at it. And there's plenty of populated area between here and there. And yeah, while 1901660 Anon has a point. Doesn't that directly contradict most people's stories about how relentless they can be when going after groups of people in the woods? I mean, I'm inclined to agree that it likely didn't attack because it considered the fight not worth the risk, 
but that implies a much more contradictory cunning that the regular spoopy experiences people claim to have had. So if nothing else, I appreciate this whole thing for how definitive it's becoming. Here's the thing people don't understand how ingrained predator instincts are. Even one of the aforementioned big cats isn't generally going to come at a human from the front or at a large group. With how fast it is, and its use of light it sounds like it's some type of ambush predator. I agree with the thought that this thing didn't want a straight on fight. B Wendigo monster. Stalking down driveway looking for some meat. So many humans so many boomsticks. JPG. Suddenly something isn't right. Full grown human male looking right at me. Fuck 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 don't make a noise. Human make steps towards me. That's it I'm out, Wendigo speed go. Decide to sit in yard across way. Some lady looking at me frantic. More humans come in one of their big metal monsters with light inside. They have boomsticks. Humans are scary Wendigo slash x slash. I think you are misinterpreting what happened in my recounting of events. It didn't use the light. I broke eye contact, and the only time I moved toward it was before it had paid any attention to me, which is likely why it noticed me at all. It didn't move away from me, it moved toward me, which was into a person's yard. We can't misconstrue events to try and tie its behaviors to another animal's. The green text was just me messing around as a joke to lighten the situation. As for it coming towards you, sounds like a show of aggression to drive you away or get you to run. You said it was over 7 feet but it was very thin, how thin? What do you think it would weigh? Oh, sorry, that was entirely my fault then. I've dealt with predatory animals before, and I think I agree with that idea. It feels like it was trying to size me up the entire time. Debating whether or not I was worth the effort. Yeah, it was probably on the lower end of 7 feet, but it was very emaciated. I'd say, given the height and weight, it was probably anywhere from 150 to 170 pounds. If what I know of body mass and such applies at all. I could be wrong though, I'm not terribly well read on things like that. MFW I live less than a half hour from there. I do I go make my slash x slash and slash k slash brethren proud? Do I go fuck the skinwalker? Your life is yours to do with as you see fit. Friend in Chico seems to have dropped off the fucking map, absolutely no contact since he stopped overnight in Nikolaus. Current theory is that he's now in Folsom. If you see a blue camper van with gold racing stripes somewhere, maybe in Orangevale PD impound lot, post it up in either this thread, if it hasn't saged, or another Fleshgate slash Wendigo slash Skinwalker slash other spooky creature thread. Hi slash X slash, long time lurker, first time posting here. Anyone interested in Far East spooky stuff? Be me, German descent. Parents moved to Korea before I was born. Because of dad going on business trips all the time plus general parental conflict, Korean friends family pretty much raised me as their own. New family is crazy superstitious, which is weird since most of the country now believes in Christianity. Live in the mountains with Korean family for most of my childhood, then moved to the city around high school age. I honestly didn't even consider all this to be creepy, it was just a part of life to me. Recently I moved to the US and whenever I mention stuff that happened in my childhood my new friends lose their shit. I guess I'll post a few and see if you guys might be interested. Here's a little background. Korean foster family is from North Korea they all came down during the Korean War. Superstitious grandfather, Christian grandmother, both maternal, parents, friends with my parents, who always wanted to GTFO of the mountains, daughter who's my age and was pretty much my only friend. Grandfather is the patriarch and what he says, goes. This includes all sorts of weird traditional ceremonies and rituals, and a lot of creepy hiking slash fishing trips. Generally a pretty chill family, lots of conflict about grandfather's superstitious bullshit though, and you can kinda see the mom kinda losing her mind over the years for some unknown reason. Live in the middle of bumfuck nowhere, you have to drive like 30 minutes to reach the nearest town. Sorry if this is all jumbled, this is my first time rationally looking back and writing it down. If there's anything I can do to make it better do tell me. 
This is about a ritual we used to do a few times every year. Apparently there are families in the city that also perform it, but none of my other Korean friends have gone through quite what I was used to. On the death day of his ancestors, grandfather sets up a mini shrine and prepares a shitload of food. It only has to be specific kinds of dishes, and has to be arranged according to color and size. After setting up the food on special tables in the living room, grandfather reads a handwritten letter generally following the lines of everyone misses you, rest well, please take this offering of food in peace and burns it. He sometimes adds a line about me, something like please excuse the blonde boy, we are taking care of him as the ritual is usually only performed by the family. Everyone takes turn bowing in a special ceremonial way. When everyone is done bowing, grandfather turns off all lights, and everyone hides in the kitchen for about half an hour. You always have to clear your throat before walking out again. Do not startle the ancestors, grandfather says. Food is partially eaten, utensils are dirty, and the seat cushions are warm. This one time when I was about six, the mom got tired of making the specific dishes, they're time consuming as fuck, since they take up the whole day if not more, and replace them with easier ones. Grandfather flies into a rage, but we don't have time to redo everything. Do you realize what you've done and all that? Finish bowing and hide in the kitchen. Hear rattling and banging from the living room. The kids get shitless, so me and the daughter hold on to the grandfather while he swears under his breath. An hour later the noise stops. Grandfather clears his throat, goes outside, turns on the light. The dishes are overturned, candles are out, something that looks like either dried blood or watery fecal matter, can't remember, is strewn on the shrine the mom always made the correct dishes from then on. Fucking nine-tailed foxes, man. These bastards are creepy as shit but the media now portrays them as some kind of big-titted QT pie furry sweat dream. B13, sorry in advance about the stories not being in timed order. No porn or anything in the fucking mountains but discovered how to jerk it. One day I go into the mountains with daughter, we'll call her Jin, to find some mushrooms. Bring one of the family Jindo dogs just to be safe, those fuckers are protective as hell. Having a good time and fucking around when Ogu the Jindo starts to bark like crazy. We see a teenage looking girl, just kinda standing there. Wearing old fashioned clothes, pick kinda related, but since this is a rural area think nothing of it. Go say hi. Glad we found someone else around our age. New girl says her family moved into the empty plot about 15 minutes away. Ogu is still barking at her but we brush it off, he's just being protective. Hang out with her for a bit. She keeps touching me, commenting on my hair and eyes, saying I'm exotic and cute. Totally gone it late dot jpeg. The sun starts going down so we ask her if she wants to come over and have dinner with us. No, but only Anon can come over to my place and see my room if he wants. It's getting dark and brother instincts kick in, so I tell the new girl I'll drop by later and take Jin home. Fucking cock blocked, pissed off as hell. Later tell grandfather what happened. Idiot boy, the empty plot isn't for sale. He tells us to take a Jindo wherever we go from then on. We meet her a few times later that week. She progressively gets more and more seductive. Dogs bark at her so just go home. We just ran home and told grandfather what happened. A few days later Ogu brings home a fox he killed. Never see the girl again. Basically nine-tailed foxes, Gumi Ho, shapeshift into women whose corpses they eat. They seduce and kill men, whose livers they eat. Once they eat a thousand livers they turn into real humans, or something. Forgot pick, see pick related. Grandfather said there are two types of ghosts Yurai Yang, which are just docile spirits, and Gui Xin, which are malicious spirits that usually just want closure. There was a small lake near where we lived. Grandfather always told us to take a white Jindo when we went near the lake, as there was a Gui Xin who lived there. Gui Xin who live in bodies of water are called Mul Gui Xin, 
but this one was also a Chunyagwishan, a virgin who had been wronged. Occasionally, from far away, you can make out a youngish looking woman who looks soaked as hell just sitting on the dock. Always thought she looked lonely and sad, instead of angry. She didn't do much but kinda hissed almost like a cat and disappeared whenever she saw the white Jindo, his name was Jingu. This one time when I'm about nine I got brave and walked out to the lake. Still pretty far away, but I can see the Guishin sitting on the dock again. Being the oddest I am, I call out something like lady, are you okay? Guishin gets up, starts walking toward me. When I say walking it was more like a cross between walking and gliding, kinda like when you stand still and look at someone going through one of those moving runways in an airport. Anyways the Guishin keeps coming closer and suddenly I realize that I forgot to bring a white Jindo. Oh shit. The Guishin is close as hell now and I can see that her facial features are all kinda blacked out and melted all together, like ink mixing in water I scream. She screams too, but stops when I stop making noise and sort of studies me. She makes a weird gurgling noise, like someone is trying to laugh underwater. Your head is yellow. She walks slash glides back to the dock. I run all the way back home, the piss cooling on my pants. The next day grandfather makes me bring some food as an offering to the lake, to thank the Guishin for not harming me. I like to think that I made her day. Thanks, it's great that people like it. Here's some info on the Jindos. Korea's national dog. Kinda looks like a Shiba, but taller, leggier, and just more brutal. Comes in three colors, white, tan, and black slash tan. Hardy little fuckers, skinny as hell but they can take out your legs like it's nothing. Protective as fuck about territory. Stubborn bastards these are, you can't train them like a Labrador retriever to do cute tricks or sit for their food or not bite annoying children, but they'll give their lives to protect you and your home. In Korean superstition, white jindos chase away evil spirits, tan jindos can fight their way out of anything, and black jindos make spirits accept you as one of them. Grandfather rarely had black jindos he was a fighter, so he had a bunch of tan jindos and some white ones for the kids, and I'm pretty sure the shotgun he had in his closet was illegal, you can't own a gun in Korea lol. Pick related. The thing about growing up in rural Korea as a foreigner is that if you run into a spirit, they're either going to be extra hostile towards you, or they're going to be too busy laughing at you to kill you. The closest school was half an hour away, so grandfather would drive me and Jin to school every morning. There were only seven kids in our grade, only three graduated. The rest either died or moved to the city. The kids were pretty cruel and ganged up on me a lot, calling me names like Yellow Monkey or Yankee, I'm German ML. Grandfather though school was shit, so he let me skip school as long as I showed up for exams and passed them. When I was 10 he got me my very own white Jindo which I named Baiku. Exploring the mountains and picking slash eating mushrooms one day. Hear something rustle in the bushes, and Baiku starts whimpering slash cowering. A black dog-like creature slinks out from the bushes. Freeze in my tracks, I wasn't sure if he was friendly or malicious, but Baiko was clearly scared and pissing himself. It looks like a cross between a big dog and a leopard, but has a long, almost trunk-like snout, the fur looks like it's ablaze and smoldering, although there is no fire or heat. The thing makes a snarling slash growling motion, but no sound comes out of its mouth. Convinced that this is how I die. I hear a gunshot go off in the distance and remember that grandfather has his illegal gun. Another gunshot goes off, this time so close my ears my whole skull feels like it's ringing and I can see the bullet whiz by. The fucking thing chases after the bullet and is gone. I hightail it out of there with my dog and grandfather. What I ran into turned out to be a bull gasa re, they eat fire and metal, and are highly hostile, apparently. As this one had claimed the deep mountains as its home, we were forbidden to go that deep from then on. Sorry bud, I'm typing this while cleaning the house. Once I'm done I'll deliver on a more timely fashion. One thing about Korean ghosts, 
both docile and malicious, is that they're very much like people. You can reason with them, most of the time, trick them, scare them, and even make friends. Of course if you just want them to fuck off the best thing you can do is start singing, although grandfather said this could potentially attract Dookie by. B14. Go to school one day because fuck it. When school ends, leave book bag in classroom and go out with gin to throw out the trash, no janitors at school so kids help out with the work. Go to pick up bag while Jin waits outside. Teacher is standing with her back to the door, just kinda staring at something on the wall. Say goodbye, she doesn't respond. Get slightly nervous, so ask her if she's okay. She turns around and oh shit she doesn't have a face. Dal Gilguishin are malicious spirits that act just like people, but have no face, hence the name, Dal Gil equals egg. From what I know, they'll usually leave you alone as long as you don't point out their lack of face or act disgusted. The thing acts just like the teacher and it's just heading way too close to the uncanny valley now. Creeped out, but also kinda pissed because I'm a moody teenager and I just want to go home. It starts talking, and even its voice sounds like my teacher. Anon, do you think I'm pretty? Bitch you don't even have a face. I don't want to piss these things off because Korean ghosts get vicious as fuck when they're mad. If I say you're pretty it will say I'm lying because it clearly doesn't have a face. If I say you're not pretty it will say I'm disgusted at its lack of face. I just want to go home and play with my goddamn dog and go fishing. Start singing the Korean national anthem really loudly. Things start screaming, sounding equally angry. I hear the classroom door open and the screaming stops abruptly. Anon, what are you doing? It's the actual teacher. Run home and bitch about Guishin's with Jin. Things started falling apart by my mid-teen years. I believe this was because grandfather was getting old and weak, but it just may be because I was pretty messed up emotionally and whatever spirits out there could sense it. B16. Doing some chores around the yard when I hear familiar voices. It's my mom and dad. I walk towards their voices, kinda tearing up because I haven't seen them since I was like four and the only reason I remember them are the phone calls that come once every few months. Angry but glad at the same time. My parents are standing at the edge of grandfather's property. Anon, it's us, let's go home now. So many things I want to yell at them, but it's like I'm too choked up. Remember grandfather didn't tell me my parents would be coming for me. I'm going to bring grandfather. Oh but Anon, aren't you going to let your mother hug her own son? Notice something's wrong about it, but too emotionally shaken. Start crying like a little bitch and kinda stand there. The dogs are barking like crazy. I can hear Jin calling me for dinner from the house. My parents keep urging me to come over and give them a hug, go home, talk to them. Come on son, it's going to be a long drive home. Wait a second. Then where's your car? They go quiet, but soon try to play it off as a joke. I keep asking where their car is. They get angry and start threatening me with punishments, saying I'm breaking mom's heart, etc. I'm still sobbing and hyperventilating, not sure whether to go to them or run back home. I think Jin noticed and told grandfather, because he came out with a dog on leash. The dog starts growling and this old leathery Korean fart bellows like a goddamn ox. Leave my grandson alone, fucking creatures. My parents let out something like a cross between a bird screeching and an old door creaking, then disappear into the grass. For some reason grandfather never speaks of this again. This shit still chokes me up a little. Thanks, I appreciate it. I have a few more stories that aren't too mundane, oh look there's a ghost, oh now he's gone, so I'll be posting them for the next few hours. Here's how our toughest dog died. Relatives come to visit for the weekend. Jin's cousins come too. One is a guy about five years older, the other is a guy two years older than us. There's also a girl but she just sits in the kitchen and does Bible study with grandmother all day so we just ignore her. 
We try to get along at first but the cousins are just too boisterous. Yelling cuss words in the mountains, throwing rocks at deer, etc. Eventually we just let them do their own thing. It turns out while Jin, grandfather, and I went fishing, these fuckers went into the mountains and found a small family graveyard. Korean family graveyards are tiny, with four or five bodies buried at most, especially if you find one in the rural areas. Anyways these fuckers trashed the place, kicking down shrines and littering everywhere. They came home after they heard someone crying and got scared. Grandfather is seething but he doesn't say anything, he doesn't expect city kids to understand. For the next few days we see angry ghosts at the edge of our property hissing at our dogs, but not able to come any closer because of our white jindos. We leave offerings around the property but they're pissed as hell and won't stop trashing our vegetable gardens. Grandfather genuinely looks stumped. One day our most prized tan jindo disappears. We think he may be hunting something, but he doesn't come home for days. Eventually we go out to look for him. Find his body, ripped to shreds, strewn around the trashed graveyard. His intact head is in front of the damaged shrine. Grandfather quietly covers his dog's head with a towel. Doesn't talk to us for a few days, just smokes his pipe out on the patio and stares into the mountains. I still miss the dog. I always think he sacrificed himself as an offering to save everyone else. In Korean mythology, magpies are harbingers of good luck and prosperity. It's said if you hear a magpie cawing in the morning, it means you'll have a friendly visitor later in the day. I like to think that magpies acted like a sort of guardian angel to me. My room is in the second floor. Right next to the persimmon tree in the garden. Magpies fucking love persimmons and there are always a bunch of them near the house. Grandfather and I make a habit of leaving the persimmons at the very top when picking them from the tree, so that the magpies can help themselves. This is just at the level of my window so I guess the magpies kinda associated seeing my face with food and general good vibes. Come home from school one day. For some reason I'm really tired as fuck so I take a nap. Magpies won't stop fucking cawing though. Some even bang and peck the window. Like an autist I yell shut up birds and try to sleep. They're too fucking loud. Swearing, I get up and storm out of the room to sleep somewhere else. As I turn to close the door, I catch a glimpse of something stuck to the ceiling. It's a motherfucking ghost. As I stare, its head turns towards me and it gives me the ugliest fucking look. But before it can react to me leaving the room, the magpies start cawing and banging at the window and it turns its attention to the birds. Run out and alert grandfather. Guy grabs a pot and pan, runs up to my room, flings open the door, and starts banging the pot and pan while yelling get the fuck out. Ghost hisses and slithers into the cracks of the wall. We knew someone died in that house before we moved in, we just didn't know the guy had hanged himself in my fucking room. We leave out an offering that night and I sleep on the couch. The next morning the offering is gone and we don't see that ghost again for a good three months. Whenever the ghost appears again the magpies do their squawk and I fetch grandfather. Feels pretty good having a personal army of magpies. Last story. B17. Start kinda having a thing for Jin, but we don't show it because a, it's a bit like incest and b, her mother is completely off the hook at this point and would kill us both. One day grandfather goes to tend to his berry patches and doesn't return. We look for him a few hours later and find him on the ground, looking peaceful and composed as hell, like he just laid down to take a nap and never got up doctors tell us he died of a heart attack. I'm stunned. The man who took me in after my own family put me aside, taught me all the values I ever held dear, basically kept me alive all these years in a patch of mountain crawling with unknown creatures. Was gone just like that Jin is also inconsolable and we spend a lot of time sitting out by grandfather's favorite fishing spot, not saying anything. We bury him in a private plot, Jin, and I go to his grave every day to clean his shrine. A few months later grandmother sells our house and we move to the city. All the dogs are sold too, 
including mine. I'm too shocked to pretend nothing happened and live with my adopted family, and too angry to live with my biological family. Grandmother gives me enough money to rent a small apartment, barely larger than a closet. Couldn't focus on anything so I fail my college entrance exams. Barely scrape by, flipping burgers and working at gas stations slash convenience stores slash stocking warehouses. In a way it's more peace than I've ever known, as I see no ghosts in my apartment. Sometimes I wonder about what happened to Jin, as we grew apart, and I knew her mother was off her rocker and sometimes physically hurt her. Meanwhile Jin is accepted to a good college. We decide to go to grandfather's grave and show him the acceptance letter, as well as perform the ritual, C1730-2265, and just don't talk to each other ever again, it was getting too weird. The whole family follows us, for some reason. It's getting dark. Just before we leave, Jin places her acceptance letter on grandfather's shrine. Suddenly her mother starts screaming. He's dead you crazy kids, he can't fucking hear or see any of this shit. She accuses grandfather of being crazy, and then yells at Jin for being stupid enough to believe all that bullshit. We try to argue back, but you saw it too. But she's raving at this point. Eventually she calms down enough for Jin's dad to take her back to the car. We just sit in front of grandfather's grave for the longest time. When we finally head back, I swear I can see a bluish flame looking thing flickering above the grave. Weeks pass. Getting paid just enough to get by, and trying to forget everything that ever happened in my childhood. One night I hear incessant tapping on my window, almost like how the magpies used to tap. Wait, I live in the basement. There is no window. Feel a deep, shuddering cold feeling in my guts, I always thought it was alerting me to a spirit nearby but now I realize it's fear. I run wildly into the street and catch a taxi to grandmother's house. I can hear screaming inside. The door bursts open and Jin runs out, blood on her arms and her face as white as paper. Something in her mother's head had snapped, and she had grabbed a kitchen knife and slashed at Jin. What about your dad and grandmother? Dad's visiting his family and grandmother was too afraid to come out of her room. Jin swears up and down that just as her mother was about to seriously stab her, a blue flame flickered out of nowhere and lit her skirt on fire. I try my best to calm her down and call 911. Things settle down from there. Jin and I realize nobody else will understand us as well as each other, we're getting married next winter. Her mother is diagnosed with schizophrenia. Grandmother goes to live with Jin's aunt. Thanks grandpapa. I'll hang around for a bit for any questions. Thanks for hanging on with me for the ride, slash x slash. Well, slash x slash, I spent a lot of my childhood years here and reading the experiences. Since then, a lot of weird things happened in my life and now, after I waited some time for things to cool off, I've decided to share them with you. I am no writer, but I will try my best. Not sure where to start so I'll just write some background info. I come from a country in Europe, born into a pretty big Muslim family. People there have a lot of old traditions and no one knows the origins. When I was about two to three years old, my family moved from our village into the city, small city. Family isn't that religious, only the old members, grandpa, grandma. 1. Be me, around seven years old. Father worked abroad, so I was alone with my mother. One night, while laying in bed at night I felt uneasy. I was afraid of the dark, but it wasn't that. I got so scared that I went in my mother's bed and covered myself with a blanket. At this point, I was terrified, sweating, and whimpering. Thought to myself I was being a pussy so I tried to relax. At that moment I felt a cold hand grabbing me by my calf. I actually pulled and the hand didn't let go for a couple of seconds. I was just lying down, silently crying, whimpering. Couldn't sleep at all. Next morning, I was trying to explain it to myself and failed. Never told it to anyone until my father told me a story about our house. I'm going to keep posting if anyone is willing to read. 2. 
Fast forward about 10 years. Family had a really rough time since we moved into the new house. No money, bad shit always happening etc. Got to the point where we had to sell the house or be evicted. We got evicted since no one wanted the house. Went to work with my father on construction. One night we were talking and he said he blames the house for everything. Said he never wanted it, but my mother insisted. He says when we moved in there was a lot of unexplained things. He found roller walnuts in little bags inside the walls when we were renovating. Usually in our culture, when you want to curse someone you put rotten food, old bones and even poop somewhere close to the person. Example, under the doormat, in flower pots, anywhere where that someone will pass by every day. 3. Now, my father isn't one to believe in these kind of things, always tried to explain everything logically bull, that changed when his brother told him that it might be jinns that are to blame for the shit luck. He told him that he knows a woman that can help if that is the case. So I was about about 10 to 11, and I remember that night they sent me to my room and told me not to get out. I heard a man and a woman corning in the house, and they went into the living room. So the rest of the story is from my father. They came and right away told them they sensed some evil shit in the house. It's an understatement to say my father was skeptical. When they went into the living room, they talked a bit and told them they'll try to fix it. How? Well, they were going to exorcise my parents. They put on this surah, verse from Quran, that is used in these kind of situations, and put headphones on my mother first. As soon as she heard it, she started screaming. I remember hearing it in my room the screams. She fell down on the floor and looked like she's having a seizure. In this moment, little me went and opened the door slightly to see what the fuck was going on. MFW mother with headphones on having a seizure while the man is holding her down and woman doing some strange shit with hands. Started crying and went back into my room. Father told me she was actually using the hands to guide the spirits away from mother. He actually saw something like a small bubble under her skin and arm. The woman guided it to the ring finger and cut out a small hole for the spirit to get out. All this shit sounds crazy, even to this day I try to ignore everything that went on. When they finished my mother was so exhausted she went right to sleep. Father stood there confused, not sure what just happened. Woman told him my mother has at least two gins in her, and it was probably from the house. Well, after that night, my parents were so scared of what they saw that they decided to ignore it. So everything went on normally, my family had a hard time in everything. Fast forward a couple of years. You don't even understand how shitty it was, everything that could gone wrong did every time. We were always fighting between each other. After a while, my mother started having these frequent panic attacks. When I was 13 I just didn't want to be in the house, so I spent all day every day outside. Just to get out of that negativity used the house only for sleeping. That went on until I was 18, and as soon as I finished school we lost the house. Moved and that's that, we still fight each other and mom still has those panic attacks. Father told me about all this and told me directly that he doesn't know how to fight it. And oh yeah, that night, when I felt the arm grabbing me, my father told me it was actually a jinn's hand. The jinn got so close to me that he could physically touch me, which is as much as they can do physically. If I remember some other stuff from my childhood, I'll write it down, but now I'll write a story my friend told me that is a bit connected. So, this story is way more interesting since my friend's family decided to fight these spirits. I was about 17 when my friend told me this. Knew him since I was 6, never lied to me, we never spoke about these kind of stuff before that. If someone else told me this same story I would call him a liar, but not this guy. His family is very religious, and one day we went out for a coffee. We were sitting and he was unusually silent. Asked him what's up why is he not talking, told me he has something to tell me. Asked me not to tell anyone ever, sorry bro. His grandfather had died a couple days before that. I'll keep this as short as possible. Grandpa died, and after funeral they went into his house. This house is kind of old, and in outskirts of a village. His family, like I said, was really religious. His aunt was living with his grandpa, and she told them how weird he was last couple of months. Always alone in his room, from time to time she could hear him speak Arabic in his room. 
Then she told them about an unmarked graveyard in their garden. Really old, like a couple of hundred years old. She said one day about half a year ago he was digging the garden and found it, there were more than two skeletons there he didn't want to dig further so he just covered the hole and continued like nothing happened. Fast forward a month and he started acting weird. Stopped the garden work, spent his days reading Quran and praying. The ant asked him what was going on, he told her they were being attacked. Attacked by those people in the graveyard. He said they speak to him, and they want him to mark the graves and have a funeral so they can rest. Ant got scared for him, asked him to go see a doctor but he refused stating that he has to fight them back. Said he worked hard and he ain't giving no one his land. Ant left him to be in well, couple of months later he died. She didn't connect the dots, but my friend's family will. So, when she told them that they searched around the house and found his curran with his journal. In the journal, just some wild shit like, name, spoke to me, he listens to me etc. Etc. There were at least 50 names there and he was keeping tabs on them, writing down everything they told him. They found a journal note that said, name, told me they were soldiers, they had a cruel death. Name, told me they want a proper funeral. They were weirded out by this, thought grandpa went crazy in his last months. Went back home and fast forward a couple of days they had a call from the aunt. She told them weird shit is going on around the house, she hears footsteps all day and night, breathing, even things falling over. Real spoopa stuff. Well, they pretty much told her she was imagining things. A week later, she calls them crying saying she got locked out of the house and that she's scared shitless pretty much. What? They tell her to come sleep in their house, about an hour drive from the village the house was in. She comes in again tells them about the weird stuff. She says she's not imagining things and that she thinks they should have a proper burial. Well, my friend's father told her that he has to check with the local priest, Imam. He goes to see him and the priest tells him that it's probably jinns. But, the thing is, there are good and bad jinns. Priest tells him about how one can, if willing, gather these good jinns, even make an army. After that, he went back and told everything to his family. They talked and after a while they concluded that grandpa did some shit she shouldn't have. Dude made a small army of jinns to endlessly fight the spirits from the graveyard. That's what the journal was for, he kept tabs on his army. Tomorrow they went to the house, marked the graveyard and gave a proper funeral to those soldiers. Things calmed down in that house. But, in their lives things were getting weird. Like my family, they found rotten walnuts and just weird stuff packed nicely around the house. They decided to buy a couple of cameras and put them around the house. They bought infrared cameras. I forgot to say, my friend's family is pretty big, he has three brothers, two of them abroad and one living with the family. Fast forward a couple of days, they were watching the camera footage, fast forward a lot, just to see if anyone was in their yard. They saw an old woman, hunched, coming in at around 2 to 3 am and going back into their shed. She took a shit in their shed. What the fuck? Tomorrow my friend went out in his car to find the woman. Searched a couple of hours with no luck. He went back and, well, tried to forget about it like all of us do when weird shit happens. Sorry for grammatical errors, writing fast cause I have to go soon. They watched that camera footage every night, and every night they saw something weird. Around 2 to 3 am, every night, the same car drives by their house, not once but like 5 to 6 times. Every 10 minutes for an hour, just back and forth. And when this car passes some weird orb-like stuff, on the infrared camera, goes from the car to their house and stays by the front door. When someone opens the door, they come in. My friend's father was sure that were jinns, and someone is sending them to his family. So the next night they waited in their yard, friend's brother even had a gun just in case. At around 2 am they saw that car. The driver must have seen them since he turned around and didn't come back. Next night same thing. So, my friend decides to search for that woman that took a shit. After a couple of hours he sees her. He described her as really scary looking like she looked like she was 150 years old. Hunched back, like 150 centimeters tall no more. And he attacked her on the street, while people passed by. 
What the fuck did you do who sent you what are you doing etc etc. She actually laughed and told him something on fucking Arabic. Friend went ape and grabbed her and screamed in her face. She said, I'm just doing what I'm told. What? She leaves her and goes back to his family. Tells them what happened, and they conclude there are more people doing things, at least two. Well, I talked to you about my family's shit luck, same thing goes for his family. One brother remarried three times, no children, other brother never got married, is in serious debt from a failed business. Those two live abroad. Well when they found out someone's been sending jinns and cursing them, they called the two brothers back home. So together they might figure out who's doing this shit. They went together to the priest and the priest told them pretty much that the curses work like this. If you want something so bad, you live for it, and you get it, the curse just makes you kind of sabotage yourself. Like the brother that was remarried, he always dreamed of having a big family. But, once he got a wife, he couldn't have a son, and then after a while he got sick jealous. And with every wife, they leave him because of the jealousy. Other brother wanted to have a big business, be the boss and be rich. He did everything by the rules, the business was looking good but then he started gambling, and the business failed cause of it. Priest said it's because of the curses. Someone is actively doing it for a long time. They go back to their house, and decide to tear down every wall in the house and look for those weird stuff they found around the house. Well, they just went ape, took the walls down, floors, everything they could. They found so many stuff inside, they filled a whole bag with them. Things inside the bricks, like the rotten walnuts, hair, and then bottle caps and small pieces of paper with some verse from Quran written in Arabic. Well they destroyed the whole inside of the house, and took out most of the weird stuff. Then they decided to contact these spirits. They put on that same surah my mother was listening to, and they started reciting Quran. They put it on speakers so every family member could hear it. Right away the brother that's in debt, fell onto the floor, screaming and shit. The more they recited, the louder the screams got. And then the really freaky shit started happening. His screams changed, friend told me it was like he got a megaphone. Just fucking loud as fuck and unearthly, like those scenes from The Exorcist. I laughed when he said it, being non-religious and all, but the dude looked me straight into the eyes. He said don't laugh that's my brother, he wouldn't fake it. I went silent, then he continued. His brother got up and started speaking to them, but not with his voice. And not in his language. Dude was speaking Arabic like it was his mother tongue, but he knew only the basics. Friend's father knew Arabic since he went to school there, and started speaking to him. Everyone knows the spirits always tell you what you want to hear. Told them they were a great family, that God watches them, that he is proud of them. Told them even that God sent a message for them, but they need to turn off the surah so he can say it. My friend's father knew better, he believed that the jinn slash entity is lying just so they turn off the surah. So he started reciting Quran again. And the screams began again. He screamed, turn it off, turn it off, but they didn't. My friend's father asked him who sent you, he screamed, turn it off, turn it off and I'll tell you. He decided not to turn it off, so after a while of screaming the brother went into seizure-like state. They held him down and continued reciting on his ear. Then he just stood still, everyone left the room, only my friend's father stayed, reciting the whole night. I know this story is wild, but believe me when I say it all happened. Tomorrow they went to the priest again and told him what happened. He said they did right, and that the dude that was possessed should come live with him for a while in the mosque, so he did. He didn't remember anything that happened, and says the last thing he remembers is the first verse of the surah. They go back thinking what should they do next. How do you fight it if you don't know who's cursing them? My friend's father decides to go and visit his brother. He lives alone in the same village the grandfather did, so he drives about an hour to speak with him. Told him everything and he said he knows how to handle this. He'll contact some priest he met a while ago and he'll come and fix it. He comes back and waits, meanwhile every night the car was passing by when they were not waiting for him. One night my friend decides to hide in the bushes, not telling anyone. He sees the car and passing and sees the license plates. Now they only have to find the car. 
Tomorrow they went out to search with no luck. After a couple of days of searching they give up, how are they supposed to find one car in a city of 50k people? They decide to guard the house every night so the dude sees them and turns back. My friend and his two brothers did it, but the car stopped coming after the night he saw the license plates. I'll cut this short since I don't have time. They went to the priest the uncle told them about which was about three hours drive. He tells them that they are exaggerating. He said it isn't so bad, whoever is doing this must have quit since he's not coming anymore. They agree and continue with life. Brother that was living with the other priest goes back to his house abroad, as well as the other brother. Things start to go back to normal, they renovated the house and it was all cool. After about three months his family goes to visit the uncle. My friend went with them. As soon as they come into the yard, he recognizes the car. It's that car that drived up and down every night, the license plates match. It was their uncle. After they leave he tells his dad about the car. His father didn't notice it, didn't even care to look. Then he turns the car around and goes back. Asks his brother what the fuck was he doing. He's faking confusion like he has no idea what he's talking about. Friend's dad attacks him, punches him, and starts screaming. What did you do? What did you do? He says he'll explain everything. Tells him how he and dad, friend's grandpa, were controlling these jinns together they gathered them to protect the land, and fight off those soldiers. When grandpa died, his jinns didn't know where to go so they started attacking him. He tried to fight them off but couldn't, since grandpa had too many, around 50. So he got ill, stopped eating and started losing it. Then he decided he has to send them away, and decides to send them to his brother since it's way easier if you know someone he said every night he did it for about a month. My friend's dad asks him about the weird woman and those shit they found in walls. He tells them that he had nothing to do with it. He says he'll find out who it is and curse them so their jinns attack them. Friend's dad told him never to speak with him again and left. Fast forward about a month. Living normally. Friend's dad receives a letter from his brother. In the letter he says he did curse those people, and jinns attacked them. They died. Two people my friend's dad knew only like acquaintances. Never did anything to them that he knows of. They died two days apart. What the fuck? So, I have and they have no idea why they were targeted by them, neither do they know if it's really finished, my friend called me like a month ago, I live abroad now and told me some new crazy shit is happening and he'll tell me all about it when I come. I'm still skeptical about it all but when I think about who told me this story, I have to believe it even though I don't want to. I'm here for about half an hour if you have any questions. Why didn't your friend's grandpa just gave the corpses a proper burial in the first place? Are you from Albania, Bosnia, or Kosovo? It's just the mentality of people there. He would rather try and fight them than give a piece of his land to them. Yes one of those three. Jeziva Prika Imam Ija Sliknut. Jokes aside about Europe becoming more Muslim every day, were there other people around your town that share your culture and know about that cursing method? Well we are European Muslims and these kinds of things are only passed through generations so not a lot of people know it, I have no idea is it like that outside of Europe. There are a lot of mixtures with paganism in our culture too but as I said only some people know this stuff.